top of the morning to you, my drunken Irish car bombs. On this episode, we celebrate St. Paddy's Day. We'll talk the dark history and lore of the holiday. We'll meet an Irish cryptid, check in with Chris Whitehouse of the White House Investigation Team, where he does the Ouija board by himself. Edgegrave Dave reviews Irish play Riders to the Sea, and John Wright continues his coverage on hypnotic regression. That and much, much more, so grab a pint of the black stuff and let's go! Do aliens exist and are they among us? Are weird creatures lurking in the darkness? Do evil entities hide in the shadows of your bedroom while you sleep? Join us as we explore all this and more on the Warped Reality Podcast. (laughs) What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 34, the St. Patrick's Day special of the Warped Reality Podcast. I'm your host, Ghost Joe, and do I have a great show for you guys tonight. So, happy St. Patty's Day to everyone. Uh, You know what they say, everyone's Irish today. So I actually, I actually am a quarter Irish though, just so, so I guess I could get a little more drunk than you guys can. So, you know, but before we get into some Irish stuff, let's talk some out of this world news. So with all of this UFO talk going on lately, scientists claim that we may find out sooner rather than later if we are alone in this universe. A top scientist says that due to super powerful telescopes, such as the James Webb Space Telescope, which are observing the galaxy in crazy detail to better understand the birth and evolution of planets and the stars, they allow us to identify patterns known as biosignatures, which is any characteristic element, molecule, substance, or feature that can be used as evidence for past or present life. Dr. Emily Mitchell of Cambridge University says that it's very likely ETs will be found as life is almost certainly quite common. She said, as we begin to investigate other planets, biosignatures could reveal whether or not the origin of life on Earth is just a happy accident or part of the fundamental nature of the universe. We've only got one biosignature here on Earth, but if we have in 10 or 20 years, as my optimistic colleagues suggest, thousands of biosignatures, we can start addressing that question. If we have enough biosignatures, we can try to work out how we compare to life on other planets. On the other end, Dr. Buzzkill, I mean Professor Kolov, says it would be foolish to predict. He goes on to say, hopefully within my lifetime, I will see something significant. Maybe in a couple of years, someone will, with the James Webb telescope will detect an atmosphere that will look Earth-like, or maybe we will find out that most planets have no atmosphere and realize we are bloody lucky on Earth. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. So grab a pint of some Guinness, and let's get started on this St. Patrick's Day history, all right? So in the 5th century, an English boy named Padraig, or Patrick, was kidnapped by Irish pirates who had broken into his family's villa. He was sold into slavery in Ireland, where he tended sheep and prayed constantly. After six years, he escaped and walked 200 miles to a port where a ship was leaving. How about that, guys? I mean, you know, you hear about your parents always saying like, oh, well, I walked or your grandparents saying, oh, I walked five miles to school. This guy walked 200 miles, right, to a port where a ship was leaving for his homeland of England. He eventually made his way back to Ireland, uh, eventually, and converted it to Christianity. Legends have him battling armies of witches and druids, turning his walking stick into a tree and banishing all of the snakes from Ireland. Although those reptiles probably were never there in the first place. Uh, He supposedly died on March 17th, which became his feast day. Hence... St. Patrick's Day, right? The legend of why we wear green on St. Patty's Day is to be invisible to leprechauns. But that was a myth created by us crazy Americans. Uh, It mainly is tied to the Ireland, uh, the Irish flag uh, with green in it. And of course, the shamrock, which of course is green. Traditional Irish actually eat bacon and cabbage, not corned beef. And which was also an Americanized version. Leprechauns are Irish folklore described as tiny, wee little men. Uh, It's said that if you catch one of these tricksters, you can barter with their treasure. 
barter for their treasure for their freedom. Uh, they may even grant you three wishes. So that there was a little Cliff Notes version of Irish history. Um, but now we're going to talk with Chris Whitehouse of the White House Investigation Team. This guy, I mean, th- this is this is amazing because he did the Ouija board. He did an experiment where he did the Ouija board by himself. Now, I've always heard in the past and, you know, we've all heard that you should never, ever do the Ouija board by yourself. So, you know, Chris Whitehouse did it to to see what could happen. And, you know, we we have to uh, love him for that because he does things so we don't have to. Right. Um, but I, I know and I know that he's like a a, a a proper English gentleman and stuff, but I must say but I am not right. So I must say this man has balls of steel. Okay. Cause I would never do this, but check it out. Chris Whitehouse, White House Investigations. In last week's episode, I spoke about my grandma who had passed and my wondering if she would come through a Ouija board all. Well, we started an experiment just yesterday on a weekend. Uh, the whole team was supposed to come to my house to take part in an experiment where we do the Ouija board at my house several times this year and see if there are any changes in activity. Now, my house, I don't consider it haunted. I don't consider it um, anything but a safe space. And will using a board make it haunted? Will it bring in things that means I start witnessing activity? Will communication strengthen because the place ends up with some kind of a charge? You know, I imagine that our sessions here might start off slow and become really clear it's just a case of getting to the bottom of when we go to other people's houses if they've used a board normally that is to blame because they've not done it right or something like that but it's a fairly controlled environment in my house so the thought was we'd get together and do session one but then life and snow meant that I was here alone And so on my YouTube channel now is that hour and a bit on the live tab and an edited version on the main feed. Now, my grandma's name was Vera and V came through. And when I asked for the secret password, it almost spelled it. The letters came through and I got quite excited, but... Didn't quite 100% it, I'm afraid. I was excited, though. However, I did learn that there were there are four spirits in my house already. Two of them are a mother and daughter from 1909 sort of era. The little girl of, of six called Louise and her mother, Sue. And so I hope when the team comes, we will find out more about these spirits They said they were protective, and I've never noticed them, and I'm quite at ease with them being around, and they obviously haven't bothered me. So I look forward to seeing what the year brings with more experiments where I get the team in and we continue to do my home. Now, Joe talked about two new stories recently. One was in England, in Staffordshire, and I looked at this supposed black-eyed child and um, no pareidolia 100% I think it's absolute bullshit I've seen so many things like that just tricks of the eye and there's, when you, if you have to zoom in and enlarge it and tweak it then our brains are triggered to see faces I just was not convinced in the slightest as for the school children where 28 had fainted or had anxiety As you say, what on earth would a school be using Ouija boards for anyway? I don't see how that would be part of any curriculum and that parents would universally allow it. But if it did happen, I wouldn't think that a spirit could mass knock out 28 or more children. I think it's much more likely that they got themselves in a state... Fear spreads, and fear is a powerful force. I think it's much more likely psychology at play there. That's my opinion for what it's worth. Probably not much. And thank you very much, and here's back to Joe. 
Thank you, as always, Chris. I, I always appreciate your opinion and, and everything that you do. Um, I Yeah, I kind of figured the same thing as well uh, with that black eyed uh, children thing too. Uh, pareidolia is a real thing. You know, um, when somebody says, Oh, do you see that? Now all of a sudden everybody sees what you see. You know, it's, it's always much better when you show somebody something to say, do you see anything here? You know, so that's a, a word of advice for anybody that may have a piece of evidence or anything like that. And if you do have a piece of evidence or you have a paranormal experience, you know what to do. Call 845-600-0744 and let me know about it. Or you could email me at ghostjoeny at gmail.com. But uh, also, again, thank you, Chris Whitehouse. Um, everybody, please check out his YouTube channels. Uh, Chris Whitehouse, um, he has two YouTube channels, one called Talking Paranormal, where he does some great, great interviews, and another one, which is the White House Investigations Team um, YouTube channel. And he also has an amazing book called Into the Darkness, Becoming Ghost Hunter by Chris Whitehouse, and it's available on Amazon. So please, please, please support him, support everybody, and check it out. So right now we're going to do some I read it on Reddit, Irish style. So this one is actually entitled, My Grandfather Encountered a Banshee. My grandpa was in his 20s when this happened. So about 50 years ago, we lived in Ireland, so there were a lot of witch stories and stuff like that. People are also very superstitious and very strict Catholics. Anyway, my granddad was a truck driver, and he delivered beef to people who ordered some meat and butchers who needed resupplied. He told me that he was driving along one morning, and it was very foggy and quite eerie. He said he thought he saw something on the side of the road. On country roads here, we don't have sidewalks. He said it was the shape of a woman, but he drove on anyway. Then he saw her at the end of the road as he came to a stop about 20 meters, 62 feet, I guess. There, she was a ghostly figure with long black hair and, and had pale white skin and no shoes. Her face was horribly ugly with an elongated jaw and no eyes. She then let out an ear piercing, piercing wail. My granddad told me that he had never heard anything like it. It was so loud, his hearing was muffled for 20 minutes after it. Anyway, he was so scared, he ran up the road and to the nearest town, which was about 8 kilometers or 5 miles away. He had left his truck back there, but he said he wasn't going back there to get it. The ironic thing is that he lives at the opposite end of that eerie road today. So for those of you that don't know, uh, a banshee is a female spirit in Gaelic folklore whose appearance or wailing warns a family that one of them will soon die. She could either appear, you know, very good looking or very, very ugly. So, yeah, so that would be pretty horrifying if you were to see one of those uh, things, especially due to the folklore surrounding it, right? Horrible reviews from Edgegrave Dave. Hey, what's up, guys? Edgegrave Dave is here, and I would like to wish each and every one of you grave diggers a very happy St. Patty's Day, Erin Gobra, and a very happy non hangover day for tomorrow as well. So when you're sitting in the pub tonight, perhaps by a nice toasty fire, passing over that last slice of Irish soda bread and down in that last pint of Guinness green flavored beer or whatever beverage of choice, maybe you'll be looking over and some Riders on the Storm by the Doors will be playing and maybe you'll be listening to something else just kind of in that mood and kind of thinking to yourself, reflecting over the year that has just begun, I would like you to think of an old ancient play called Riders to the Sea or perhaps I should say it as the following is an old ancient myth from ancient Ireland. These are the very lyrics to, a, to the song of the play of the same name. Back when Ghost Joe and I were in the Warp Reality band that the song started with. 
You see, when I was in my school days or college days back in the day, and just to kind of give you a little hint on that, yes, there was internet, <laughs> that was very good, but there were a few blockbusters too, where I was looking at those very horror sections <laughs> from A to Z. It, at this time, I had to look at, or read rather, uh, something of a cultural play that had meaning about life or society, something that had meaning, something that you can kind of learn from and think about. And my mother was actually an English teacher, and upon rummaging through the books of literature in the basement, I discovered the play Riders to the Sea by John Millington Singe from the year 1904. Upon turning the pages of this play, I realized that it had quite the impact on me already, as the horror of this play was something that was not a monster, but something that was actually life and death itself. You see, one of the characters in this play, and there's a very small cast of characters, is something that doesn't speak, but something that actually takes and that's the sea itself. It is both a provider and a killer. The roaring and windy sea is pervasive. It's always watched by the people for what it can give and also for what it can take. And what happens is this actually separates the islanders and secures their identity from the mainland. It seems that every single person that is on this island understands that in order to better themselves and to get out of poverty, that they have to move forward. And in order to do that, there were some modern times that were going on on the mainland. In here, we have the Aran Islands. And this is one of the locations in Ireland that sort of had the last hints of paganism in a way. You know, every everything religious-wise was basically Christianity at this point, but there was a lot of folklore that was actually going on. Uh, there were people that had a lot of different beliefs. Uh, in 1897, John Millington Singe was encouraged by his friend to actually go down to these islands and check it out. And then when he went down there, he heard a story of a man whose body had washed up on the shore. And upon these stories, there was a lot of myths and kind of ghost stories about that. And that made him think about a lot of things. And this gave birth right to the play. At this time, I am going to issue a mean green edge grave warning. Spoiler alert. So this is a one act straight play. It has a very small cast of characters. Those characters are Moria, an old poor woman, a mother that has lost both her husband and five sons to the sea. Bartley, her last surviving son, Kathleen, her older daughter, Nora, her younger daughter, and various villagers who do pass by, men and women. There's also a young priest that although you do never see him, his presence is physically known. So the gist of the story is that every single person that Moria loves has been taken by the sea. Her son Michael, which she is the most fond of, is a skilled rower and fisherman. He has been missing for about nine days. Very soon, while her two daughters, Nora and Kathleen, are baking a cake, his clothes wash up upon the shore and are brought in. Also, the stick that he used for fishing is there as well. Bartley, right now, is aware, but he doesn't really care because he needs to make a profit. There is so much poverty going on in this island. It's like they're secluded by a dimension of a different time. They know that the modern world is happening with them on the mainland, and the only way to get there is crossing the sea. But Bartley ignores the perils of the sea. He wants to make a small profit. Moria doesn't even bless his voyage. She begs and pleads with him not to go, but he's very respectful. He understands what he has to do, but he doesn't want to upset his mother any further. Eventually, he does go, and very quickly, he does get taken by the sea when his horse does throw him over. It is said that the ghost of his brother Michael is riding behind him, understanding, and he cannot find his eternal resting place. Moria has a speech that happens towards the end of the play, where once he is finally gone, she says that no man at all can be living forever and we must be satisfied 
She accepts her place in life, and she understands that fate cannot be escaped, and that the true monster here in horror is actually fate. That you have your place in life, and that there's very little that you can do to change it. There's so many tragic elements that this certainly does have a lot more tragedy than it is horror. There's nothing scary here in by way of monsters. It's just the way that you think and that you have your place in life and that there's this unstoppable force that needs to be reckoned with. And sadly, the coffin that was going to be used for Michael was actually used for Bartley. And of all things, she does not have the nails they are forgotten to actually make the coffin with. Um, takeaways from this is really, again, it's just something that really makes you think. Um, it's just about, you know, is there really joy in life? Is there something that you need to do? Is there something that's preventing you from doing something? Uh, you, you need to listen in your heart to the relationships that you have. Um, you have to consider natural forces like the sea, um, you know, before you embark on the challenges of life. <clears throat> you can never imagine yourself achieving your goal without the favor of the universe. And, you know, can you really get better? You know, does um, something stop you? Do you, you know, are you within your own element to do something or can you not change it? And these are, you know, certainly questions that that you think about. Um, certainly these are things that I think about while I'm downing my last sip of beer here, you know, but you know, um, there is certainly positivity. You do have to have to try to stay positive in the best that you can, but acceptance sometimes of pure tragedy is a horror of life itself. So this is certainly a different type of review. And there have been other forms of media as well. There was actually an opera that was done in the early 1900s, as well as a 1935 short black and white film, and even a 1987 colored film. Well, I had hoped that there'd be colored film in 1987, so I certainly want to check those out as well, although I've seen clips. Speaking of clips, if you go on YouTube, there have been various renditions of the play itself, which is really cool. And while you're on YouTube, go ahead and type in Riders to the Sea Warp Reality, and you can check out our rockin' song. Uh, this was actually put up by the bass player, Nat Gallo. Perhaps uh, Ghost Joe might even put up a link. Just want to go ahead and wish everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day once again, and stay spooky and stay lucky. Back to you, Ghost Joe. Thank you so much for that awesome review, as usual, Dave. Um, and actually, it's it's funny because when I was listening to your review, I, I almost got a little giddy because every time you were mentioning the characters and stuff, I'm like, oh, I remember that from the song. I remember that from our song. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so guess what, everybody? I'm going to play you some of the song right now. Check it out. Riders to the Sea by Warped Reality. Following is an old ancient myth from ancient Ireland about some sons that were searching where they could not dwell. And there was human misery. They are doomed. This is their tale.
All right, so that's all you're going to get of that song. If you want to hear the rest of it, you could check out the link in the show notes for the YouTube channel that uh, that has that song. Uh, I hope you guys like it, actually. It's real old school, 80s sounding, and that's that's what we love here at uh, the Warp Reality Podcast, at least me and Edgegrave Dave. I know that much. So, yeah, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that, and check it out. It would mean a lot to us. So right now we're going to take a little trip to the cryptid zoo and talk about the monster of Muckross Lake. In 2003, scientists had conducted a series of sonar scans in the lakes of Killarney to determine local fish populations. What they found was a large solid object that they concluded, they concluded this by the way, was a giant sea monster, not unlike the Loch Ness monster from Scotland. Nicknamed Mucky, after the Muckross Lake, there have been numerous sightings and picture and video evidence of the beast. There is a nearby mountain peak that is known as something I can't pronounce or the peak of the serpent, uh, which leads some to believe that this mountain peak's name is more evidence that possibly a large serpent-like creature has lived in Muckross Lake for a long time. So I know that was a short one, but I think it's pretty cool that it happened not too long ago, really. I mean, that was only 20 years ago, which actually that sounds like a long time ago now that I think about it. Man, I'm old. Shoot. Anyway, actually, that it's crazy because that 2003 was three years after Dave and I had created Riders to the Sea, the song. So anyway... Uh, you know, a little history there for the Warped Reality fans. Um, so now let's get on with some Hypnosis Regression Part 2 by Mr. John Wright for the Wright Headspace. Take it away, John. Thanks, Joe. So today's segment is going to deal with Martin T. Orn, MD. Um, when it comes to ufology, we tend to use the word experts way, way too liberally. Um, especially when there really is no official field of study in regards to ufology. There are no universities that offer courses in this stuff. So if there is no legitimate accreditation, how can you call yourself an expert? So enter Martin T. Orn. Why? Because this dude is an expert. His credentials are impeachable, impeccable, whatever other word you want to substitute here. Um, he has a Bachelor of Science degree from Harvard University, which he received in 1948. He has his MD, which he received from Tufts University Medical in 1955. And he has a PhD in psychology from Harvard University, which he received in 1958. In regards to his job experience, uh, he was the director of experimental psychology at the Institute of Pennsylvania Hospital. He's a former professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he is also the former president of the International Society of Hypnosis. And lastly, he was very influential with um, what is referred to as the MK Ultra program. This was something that was funded or the majority of his work was funded by the CIA. Um, you can look into the MK Ultra. A lot of the documents that are associated with are now declassified and you can look this up online if you're <laughs> if you're uh, too lazy to look this up i'll give you a real quick synopsis of what mk ultra was all about um it was the cold war russia versus the united states uh people spying on each other and basically trying to figure out what the other party knew one of the ways that you could try to find that out is by locating spies. If you could actually locate a spy, then what you might do is interrogate them. What the MK Ultra program did was try to figure out were there certain ways or certain techniques that you can use during the interrogation to get reliable information. The other thing they looked at was trying to involve psychoactive drugs in the process. So maybe between the techniques, the psychoactive drugs, you might discover a quote unquote sort of truth serum. The other thing that he looked into is the Manchurian candidate syndrome, whether or not it was possible that a prisoner of war could be taken and then could be brainwashed. If you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And again, you can find this information online. 
What I'd rather spend a little bit more time talking about is his beliefs in regards to hypnosis. First thing that I'd like to point out is um, he had written a paper. This appeared in the International Journal of Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis. Um, this was in October of 1979. The article was entitled, The Use and Misuse of Hypnosis in the Court. Um, the article basically went on to talk about how the Supreme Court recognized that testimony from sessions in which hypnotic regressions were done would not be used in a criminal court case because they had basically come to the conclusion that the information was unreliable. One of the other things that he points out is that even if people are hypnotized, just because they're under hypnosis doesn't necessarily mean that they're automatically going to tell you the truth, which kind of rolls into the next point, which is they could potentially be lying. There's the potential that exists where a subject could pretend to be hypnotized. And one of the things that he notes is that even if you are a highly experienced hypnotist, you could potentially be fooled by this. One of the best examples that you can look up that actually ties into Martin Orne is the Hillside Strangler case. So if you want, pause right here, go look up Hillside Strangler, type in Martin T. Orne, see what it comes up with and see how he was able to prove that this gentleman was full of crap. He also warned that a aggressed person asked about specific details, puts tremendous pressure on that person and will cause them to fill in the details with memories or fantasies from different points in their life. It could have been a TV show they watched. It could have been a book they read. It could have been uh, a conversation they may have had with another person and in searching for answers, we'll take that information and fill that void. He additionally cautioned that there is no way, however, by which anyone, even a psychologist or a psychiatrist with extensive training in the field of hypnosis, can for any particular piece of information determine whether it is actual memory versus confabulation unless there is independent verification. And all too often, you're going to find that there are people that when they put people under, they get these, they get these bits and pieces of information and they think automatically, oh, it must be the gospel truth without actually going outside of that session and doing some searching to find out if in fact those things that they're talking about within the session are actually real. So question is, why would a subject do so? Why would they do these things? So one of the first things that he points out is that subjects are highly suggestible under hypnosis. So even though they may be sitting there looking calm, when you ask them something, it could be the way that you ask it. It could be the tone in your voice. It, it, there's all kinds of different things that go into it that could definitely influence what they, uh, what they are going to kind of in their brain search for. He said that that suggestibility leads to the creation of what he called pseudo memories and that those pseudo memories could come from movies. They could come from, as I said before, magazines in more modern times. It could be social media or it could be discussions prior to the sessions having even taken place. And this is something that I'll touch on when um, I get into one of my later segments on this. What he believed was the best possible course of action is what they call a free narrative recall. Uh, basically, what you're going to do is you're going to regress the subject back to whatever day, time that the experience took place. Once you do that, basically, you're going to ask them to talk to talk about their experience. And when they talk about it, you just allow them to continue to talk as the uh, the interviewer. Your job is to sit back, document and provide minimal interference. And one of the things that we'll see with later segments is there's a lot of interference. Uh, the next thing he said was the more frequently that a subject reports the event, the more firmly established the pseudo memory will become. So if you have one, two, three sessions in which you ask that person about the same exact topic, that what's going to happen is it's going to reinforce that memory in their minds. So it could have been just a dream. But now what you're doing is you're taking that dream and you're reinforcing it and you're making it a permanent memory in their mind. 
One of the things that Dr. Orn used to do to try and kind of test his subjects is what I refer to as the Orn experiment. Basically, what he would do is before he would do a session, he'd ask the client subject about the night before. Okay, did you sleep well? Uh, what time did you go to bed? Did you sleep through the night? Did you wake up at any point in time? After verifying that the subject had a, basically an unremarkable uh, night, that they were able to sleep through the night and that uh, there was nothing that really disturbed them, he would then begin the session. During the session, he would ask the subject if they heard two noises. Now, he had already known prior to this that they heard absolutely nothing because they said they slept through the night. Now, what he noted was at this point, the subject would start to explain, oh, I heard the noise. And then they would talk about how they got up, they went to the window and, oh, I saw this or I heard this. And they would basically start trying to identify the cause of the noise. And he said, in most cases, they would give a full description of what it was that occurred. Now, what's important about this? He had already verified with that person prior to the session that there was nothing remarkable about that night, that they had slept through the night. There were no disturbances. What he's putting here is showing you that these people are, even though they are under hypnosis, are highly suggestible, that just adding one little thing could basically change the whole entire narrative that you're trying to get out of the person. One of the other things that he pointed out was if a subject is told prior to the ending of the session that they will recall the incident, that it will become a permanent part of their conscious memory. And again, the more frequently this occurs, the more permanent and vivid that memory becomes. The problem with that idea is if you do those things, it's going to cause some type of damage, whether you want to call it physical, whether you want to call it mental, it's going to cause problems. So because of this, he tried to come up with what he believed was the best set of guidelines that you could come up with so that you could guide your sessions. One of the first things that he said is prior to any contact with that person, as soon as they walk in the door, you don't have a conversation with them. You don't say, hi, hello, how are you? What do you do for you? Just they come in. As soon as they come in, you hit your record button. You tape the whole entire session from beginning to end. Meaning, as soon as they come in, they sit down, you click that record button, and you don't click the stop button until the session is over and the subject has left the office. So that this way, you cannot influence in any way, shape, or form what it is that they're going to see or say or do. Um, so because there are no prior conversations, you don't have to worry about influencing that person and planting what he referred to as a post hypnotic suggestion in that person's mind. The other thing that he wanted was to make sure that the only person that would be in that room would be the hypnotist and the subject themselves. Why? Because if you bring other people into that situation, their reaction reactions can influence the subject. Meaning if somebody's like, oh, oh my God, and they react that way, what that then does is it puts pressure on the witness to come up with some other type of information to help feed that. So it's going to change the witness testimony. The other thing that he mentioned was that you never, ever tell the subject prior to the ending of the session that they are going to recall everything that had occurred during that session. Why? Because now it's going to produce those pseudo memories and those pseudo memories are going to cause greater psychological damage down the road. Um, at this point, I'm going to come to a close because there are, again, other things that I could talk about at this point that I'm going to mention in the next segment. Thanks a lot, Joe. I'm going to kick it back to you. Thanks again, John, for your awesome segment, as always. Um, yeah, I like I said in the last episode, I love learning about hypnosis. I think it's extremely interesting. And uh, yeah, that's a huge misconception uh, regarding hypnosis and the fact that people feel that, oh, well, if they're under hypnosis, they must be telling the truth, right? But that's not 
that's not the case. You know, um, a, a lot of the time you're very aware of you being under hypnosis. So, well, f- pretty much most of the time, if, if not all the time, you're, you know that you're under hypnosis. So you could lie. It's, it's not like, or if you're not comfortable saying something, uh, that could be the case as well. You know, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, like, oh, it's a truth serum or anything like that. It's definitely, definitely not. So uh, with that being said, thank you again, John, but on now to some haunted eBay. All right. So the first piece is dark ghost haunted 1974 coin. I got to get rid of this. And mind you, it's a quarter. It's a very, very dirty looking quarter. And the starting bid is $1,500 for the starting bid. Or you could buy it now for a very, very low price of $10,000 for a a quarter. Um, And it's Pflugerville, Texas. That's where it's coming from. But it is free shipping. So, hey, thanks a lot, guy. So um, here's the description. I wasn't the type of guy to believe in haunted objects and stuff until I came across this piece in an antique store, and for some reason it called my attention. I bought it at around six months ago, and after I acquired this piece, literally, my life went upside down and weird stuff started to happen for no reason. Like, I were to hear noises when I was alone, and I started hearing footsteps. One day, the cabinet where this coin was being kept out of nowhere the doors literally opened and i saw it open and close which is impossible it is as it is one of those small tables besides my bed made of wood and it's never happened before i went back to the store where we bought the piece and the gentleman who sold it to me had said that after he sold the piece he stopped taking half of his medicines that he that he was taking he thought that he had heard and seen stuff happening same as i described to him but he thinks it might have been just his paranoia so last week i went back to the store where i had gotten the coin to talk with the man again the weirdest thing happened there was no store or not even a single building in the place that i went what is incredible is that unless i'm losing my mind i went there twice i know exactly where i went And it's just like nothing was ever there. That's crazy. All right, on to the next item. This one is entitled Authentic Haunted Antique Rotary Phone. Real Haunted Extremely Active Spirit. And it's going for $195. And the shipping is $14.99 coming from Fairfield, Iowa. When I was a child, we lived in my grandmother's house, and it had an old rotary phone we found in the attic space. It would spin and dial numbers at all hours of the night and day. After she passed and we grew older, we learned our grandmother lost her first husband at war and never gave up hope of him calling home. It wasn't scary to us at all, and she watched over our family every night. We would see her by the doors, and we knew we were safe. This is the most coolest haunted item I have ever had. This is a good energy. I can no longer have it in my home, as the energy is too strong, and I cannot benefit from it any longer. Haunted phone. Activity is footsteps, full-body apparitions, shadows, flickering lights, the phone dialing on its own. Wow. Well, that's... that's uh a little bit comforting and a little bit not so comforting. But uh, yeah, so again, as I always say, the Warp Reality Podcast and I, Ghost Joe, are not responsible if you happen to purchase any of these items and something does or does not paranormally, paranormally happen, uh, you know, from you purchasing these things. Um, but if they happen to, you know what to do? Give me a call, 845-600-0744. Let me know about it or email me at ghostjoeny at gmail.com. So that's going to do it for me, everybody, in this St. Patrick's Day episode. Thank you, as always, to Edgegrave Dave, John Wright, and Chris Whitehouse for all of your awesome segments. On the next episode, we will feature all of your favorite segments told by me and my Warp Reality team airing on March 31st. So check it out. Have a happy and safe St. Patty's Day. And stay spooky. Later. 
Thank you for listening to the Warp Reality Podcast. And thank you to all my guests and contributors that helped make this show possible. For more episodes, guest info, social media links, merch, and more, please check out WarpRealityPodcast.com. If you have a paranormal experience you would like to share, questions, comments, or you'd like to be a guest on the show, please leave me a voicemail at 845-600-0744. Or you can email me at ghostjoeny at gmail.com. You can do so anonymously if you'd like. Also, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or WorldRealityPodcast.com. Have a great night, everyone, and don't forget to change your thoughts.